Alright, welcome back. As promised in my introduction video, I'm going to tell you what I went through to rebuild this lathe and make it uh, actually a lathe and usable. Like I said, um, I was completely green. I had no idea what I was doing. I looked at everything possible and still couldn't get decent cuts out of it. So I called a friend of mine who actually is part owner in a machine shop and he drove down. First thing he did was he grabbed a tool post and pushed and pulled on it, looked at me and said, Dave, you're never going to ever get a decent cut until nothing moves. And he showed me, uh, just in the compound where the gib screws are, huge gap. You could rock this thing back and forward like crazy. So after he left, I started working with the gibs, tightening and loosing and playing, and I just couldn't get anywhere with it. It just would not... You know, it was either locked down or, and wouldn't move, or it was just rocking like crazy. So I pulled, you just unscrew this, keep going, and you can take the whole compound right off. I looked at the actual gib itself and the screws, and one problem was the screws had a flat face on them, and they had made a dent in the actual gib keyway itself, and it kept falling in the same spot. So you, when you tightened it up, it was just off. So first thing I did was I took uh, the screws and took them to the grinder and made nice balls out of the tip of them and took the gib itself and filed away the dent that was made. Put it back together and adjusted it and that made an improvement. I could actually start getting some kind of decent cuts. But the next thing I did was you know, it just, just something seemed funny. There was high spots or low spots. So again I took it completely apart and I took the lead screw out, put it back together, put the gibs all back in, tightened it up, and just by hand I went back and forth and back and forth about 50 times. Disassembled it and took a look at the gib and I could see high spots, uh, shiny spots where things were rubbing on it. So what I did was uh, Napa sells this um, lapping compound that you use for valves on a car when you want to redo the valves. So I bought the finest grit lapping compound they had, put the grit on the whole gib and again just went back and forth for hours with it and tightened the gibs up carefully because you don't want to make another low spot or a high spot and kept doing it and then disassembling it and cleaning it until I finally had a finish where it looked like everything was shiny. It was on the whole thing. Put it all back together with the lead screw started getting some really really nice cuts out of it. Um, the second thing that I did was I noticed they have a spacer on the ends here and the spacer is designed when you run the screw down it's going to push this collar all the way up against the, the base and it was just friction and all kinds of problems with that. So what I did was I remachined these guys so they go over, down and they have a couple of thousandths uh, lip to keep this thing, to keep a gap in here of two or three five thousandths, whatever you wanted to do. That made this so smooth now, it, it, no problems at all. So I really like that, but in taking this apart be very very careful because this is held in place by this um, kind of shell spring thing and when you pull this up it's gone so you gotta hold your hand over there and try to work the thing off don't lose the spring like I did because I had to make another one out of banding metal or whatever so that straightened this all up and then um, the next thing was I was looking at for vibrations because the whole thing was vibrating a lot and so that was I'm sure impacting the surface. Um, take the chuck off, run the machine, see if there's any vibrations without the chuck. If there is, track it down, fix it. Um, I had put the chuck back on and there was a lot of vibrations and well this isn't a stock chuck, this is a 4 inch rather than a 3 inch. And the adapter plate that I bought, if you look at the back of it, it's got 
regular holes for the three screws, but there's two extra screw holes, which means it's designed as a universal for a bunch of different chucks. Well, that's a lot of metal that's missing, and that was throwing it way out of balance. So I machined some steel to completely fill in those empty holes, um, and that got rid of all the vibrations. That, it's really nice and smooth now. And you can take it way up, and there's just nothing to it. So that took out of the vibrations, and then the machining looked a lot, lot better. It was very good. But there was still a little bit of movement in the saddle. And if you look at it, it's kind of weird how they did it. There's no real gibbs or anything. They just have uh, a piece of steel, flat steel, that clamps on the bottom of the ways here. And it's adjusted by just putting pressure on that. So it's kind of weird, but I had to take uh, a regular Allen wrench that fit the screw underneath there and saw it off so I can get in there and tweak them from time to time. I couldn't really do anything to redesign it. So I just, on a regular basis, um, I'll check the movement here and I'll check the, the saddle to make sure it's not moving. So that fixed that. Um, the last thing that I got into was when you lock down the, uh, the whole saddle and you move this, you really don't want to see any movement going back and forth or on play or whatever, backlash. And if you take this apart, which is really a pain because you got to kind of manipulate everything at the same time to get it completely out, you'll see these side screws are controlling two kind of gibbs on each side of this claw mechanism that grabs the lead screw. And the problem is you got two gibbs and you got a lead, you got a set screw that's pushing here and pushing here. Well, the actual claw is sitting down here and there's nothing supporting the top gib. So I had to go to the mill and carefully figure out what the width of this was and machine a blank piece of part that sat in the top. Now I can evenly tighten it up and it's all supported and now you know, when I crank it down I don't really get any backlash at all coming out of this. So that's basically everything that I did to rebuild this and to get it to um, really good uh, condition. One other note is you'll see back here there's this tin cover that covers up the motor trying to protect it. There are holes on the side and inevitably when you're machining especially aluminum at kind of a high speed aluminum comes off almost as a dust and it winds up inevitably going in the hole and into your motor and the next thing you know is your motor is shorting out and your GFIs are tripping and you're wondering why. So I had to take it completely apart, blow it out with compressed air, and I said, forget this, and I taped it off. There's plenty of ventilation underneath here for air to get in there, but you want to stop all the dust or any chips or anything from going in there because it's going to go right in the motor. Um, now, in machining, nobody in all the videos ever clearly stated where the tool is supposed to go. And through trial and error, I realized that you need to set the top of the tool absolutely dead center with the work. You can't be too high because it won't cut right. You go too low and it's going to be kind of funny. Where's the piece of scrap here? Scrap, scrap, scrap. Uh, yeah, I guess I can use this. So, once you have the easy way to find that dead center too, or know that you're absolutely on dead center, is by doing a face off. Oh, I also just tilt it. Um, I know all the videos show this is supposed to be straight and go in, but I get better results with, yeah, I think it's like a 15 degree uh, tilt to it. And I've got a line down here that I kind of guide me that I am at 15 degrees. But when you face off, you should be absolutely flat. If you're dead center, if you're not dead center, you're going to have a little tit on there. If you're dead center, it'll just face right off and be an absolutely clean, smooth surface. pull that out and try to show you. But once you have it set dead center, then you're set. And that's why I was, started building my own tools because I hated that thumb screw thingy and you were playing with that forever, constantly moving because it was always shifting on me. 
So these are all fixed and they just drop in and they're dead center. Let me see if I can get that up there so you can kind of see it. I don't know. It's absolutely smooth. What else was I going to do? Oh, I guess I can show you kind of like what's the finish that I'm getting on this guy. And there is a sweet spot. With these tools, the Harbor Freight um, Indexable Carbide quarter inch set, someplace around 15 degrees, if you hit it, you don't need to do anything to finish this off. It is an insane surface that you wind up getting. All right. And the speed, I'm just taking it, I'm in high gear, and I'm taking it to about the middle, and that seems to be the best speed. Uh, let me go a little further. Oops, back. Look at that. Really nice finish. What was that? That was about a 5,000 cut. Yep. We'll do a steal in a minute here. Okay, that's it. Really nice finish. And you can also play with. Um, I've got a whole assortment of sandpapers that you can shine it up or go even further. This is a uh, 1200. Usually I do 600, but I can keep my fingers out of there. Yeah, that's not too good. Well, that's the concept. With um, aluminum, anything. You can hit it with different sandpapers while it's rotating and get all kinds of different finishes. You can bring it all the way up to a mirror if you want. Steel. Like I said in one of the videos, this is strictly used for aluminum. Soft metals and stuff. This is the one I have dedicated towards steel. Crank that down. Where's a piece of steel? Which one is this? This is 1018. There's lots of different steels that I tried. Some of them don't, don't even bother. <laughs> They're like nasty steel. All right, let's face it. Uh, let's do a little work on this guy. And cutting oils. There's, oh yeah, there's two. This one, I forgot where I bought it. A9, it's specifically for aluminum. I think I ordered this from Grizzly. Where's the uh, bottle? Where it is? Oh, there it is. Here's the can. Bel Belton or something. A9 cutting oil. Oop, turn it that way. You can read it. But I put it in these little bottles. So this I use quite often on aluminum for finishes. I don't see too much of a difference doing it. For steels, there's uh, soluble oil that you mix with water. I've got that from Amazon. That's a kind of a cheap uh, can. You get a big thing of it for like $10 or WD-40 and it seems like I'm getting better results with WD-40 and you do want to use some kind of lubricant on steel because this thing gets real hot and you'll see it in a minute and it's coated where to put it there <laughs> go over and in Gets a little hot. Let's see if we can do a 2000 cut. We're going to strain the whole seal. It's kind of hard to cut into. That's kind of the finish. Uh, like I said, when you hit the sweet spot, you don't have to do anything afterwards. Otherwise, this guy, you know, I do have to hit with sandpaper usually. That's 3,800. Uh, Where is one? Well, there's 800. Oh, I can use this guy. This is, I think this is 220. But you'll see a lot of people doing this just to get the surface really nice. 
pretty good. Well, it should be finer. There's 800. Oh yeah, that's taking it down nicely. And you get a really nice finish. The other thing I do is there is this really uh, scotch brake. This is really tough stuff, and it it takes it down pretty quick. You know. What? So the scotch brite is kind of like what I use at the very end. Sandpaper a little bit and then scotch brite. Uh, you can see the finish on that. It's not too bad. Alright. Um, oh, I guess I wanted to do one last thing, which is cut off. Because cut off is very difficult. In every video you see on YouTube, they all say the same thing. Rigidity, rigidity, rigidity. Yes, everything has to be rock solid or you're not going to make it. So. But I also saw one video where the guy said shows his magic trick. He puts the tool in upside down, hits reverse, and it stops chatter. Well, not really. It's not necessary. All right, let's straighten this out. Oh, forgot to do one thing. There was a cute trick I saw. It made sense. Come on out. On one video, on how to square this guy up, because you do have to make sure it's really square. Boom. And you come over and you just hit it. Come on, you loose? Yeah. There, perfectly square. Nice trick, I like it. So I just keep a junk roller around so I can do that. Alright, put this guy back in. Oh, this is way too far in. There we go. Alright, it's in there. Come over, pick a spot, I guess a pick here. Alright. Slow RPMs. Real slow. Does it. And it will get hot. So I do put this is where I do use the A9. I always use it on cutoffs. It goes right in. I can be pretty aggressive with it, but I don't want to be that aggressive with this tool. But see, no check. Or very little. You can see how fast I'm turning this. This was not even close to being possible when the uh, compound was loose. You have to, if you really want to do a good job, you can just lock down the screws here and lock the whole compound down and then go in. That way you know you're absolutely rock solid. All right, put that away. Anything else? Oh, yeah. A lot of people are interested in a tachometer. This was like twelve dollars from um, Amazon, and because I'm an electrical guy, I guess I had all the parts to just build a little sensor circuit that's here on the side, and a little wheel with holes in it that just strobe it. And I had it working for a while. The wires kind of came off. I hadn't built. A stand for it or something that will hold it there. But I'm finding I really kind of don't need a tachometer. I just know where to set the knob to get different speeds and different cuts. So I think that's everything that I need to talk about as far as making a Harbor Freight lathe a lathe. So thanks for watching.